welcome to today's webinar, The Art and Science of Art Asking Meaningful Evaluation Questions. This webinar is brought to you by Evaluate, the evaluation hub for the Advanced Technological Education Program. Evaluate works to evaluate evaluation in the AT community by offering trainings, cultivating a community, researching emerging topics, and collecting data about the ATE program. Be sure to check out Evaluate's website to learn more. The slides and our resources, the evaluation question checklist, are available in the handout tab, and you can access those on the top right-hand side of your screen. You can also access these documents on our website, and the recording from today's webinar will be available in a few days, and that will be mailed to you, emailed to you. I'm Emma Binder. I'll be the moderator for today's webinar. Lori Wingate is our presenter. We both work with Evaluate, which is located at the Evaluation Center at Western Michigan University. We'd like to recognize our Evaluate team who have worked behind the scenes to help bring this webinar to you today. And a special thanks goes out to Adrian Salea from The Mark USA, who was the webinar's ATE community reviewer and provided valuable feedback at our webinar rehearsal. And as always, we thank Carolyn William Noren, our copy editor. This webinar is designed for individuals funded by the NSF's Advanced Technological Education Program, or ATE for short. The ATE program is focused on improving technician education, mainly through two-year colleges. It funds projects in high-tech areas like advanced manufacturing, engineering technologies, IT, nanotechnologies, and many more. This is a good time to point out that the views expressed in this webinar are those of the presenter and do not necessarily reflect the views of the National Science Foundation. And with that, I'll hand it over to Lori to get us started. Well, thank you, Emma, and welcome, everybody. I'm really enjoying seeing everyone's greetings in the chat and where you're all uh, tuning in from, so welcome. Um, our webinar today has two parts that correspond to two objectives. To start off, we will review the function and form of evaluation questions. Then in the second part, we'll discuss important sources to consult to determine what your project's evaluation questions should be. Um, at the end of these segments, we're going to have question breaks, um, but you can question, put your questions in the chat box at any time, and Emma's going to keep track of those and bring them up in the Q&A breaks. The second section is actually a bit longer, uh, so we're going to pause for a question break halfway through that part. Now, sometimes when people hear the term evaluation questions, they think um, of, or they might think of specific questions they might find in a questionnaire or an interview protocol. So to be clear, that is not what we're talking about here. Evaluation questions um, are overarching questions about a project's merit, worth, or significance that will be answered based on evidence gathered through the evaluation process. So we're really talking about big picture questions about a project or a program or whatever you're evaluating. And these big picture questions are the ones, are ones that will reveal something about the project's merit, worth, or significance. And I use these particular terms here because they are the ones that are usually used in the formal definition of evaluation, which is the systematic determination of something's merit, worth, or significance. But I will ask you, so what are some more typical everyday terms that we could use here instead of these uh, terms merit, worth, or significance. So I'd like you to use the chat to share some other terms, just single words that are synonyms to these are very similar in the meeting. And I'll, I'll share some uh, to get us started. So a synonym for merit, for example, would be quality. So evaluation is largely concerned with quality. And a synonym for, value, or for worth is value. Evaluations often investigate how worthwhile or valuable something is. And in place of significance, we might say importance. So I'm, now I'm able to look at the chat. Okay, I see Danny saying eff efficacy. Amy's talking about ROI. Rosemary says importance. Um, Michael's pointing out effectiveness. All right, you guys definitely have the, have the hang of this. Um, so in addition to Merit, worth, oh, I didn't mean to do that, hello. Merit, worth, significance, uh, importance, quality, value. Um, an evaluation question might focus on a project's effectiveness or impact or progress, uh, performance, efficiency, relevance, sustainability, all great words that really speak to the whole point of evaluation. And a common thread across these terms that, that I've shared, that you've shared, are all um, 
and they all point to what is valued or desirable. So we're not seeking data points or simple facts, but complex conclusions about a project's quality or the value of its importance, um, value or importance of its outcomes. And underlying these, these terms are implication for what we can learn about a project's strengths and weaknesses so that information can be used uh, for improvement as it's underway. Now it's also important to keep in mind that these are not just questions that we come up with uh, to put in our evaluation plans and then just forget about them. So we need to stay focused on these questions, use them to determine what data should be collected in our evaluations and how those data should be analyzed, and then circle back to them uh, when it comes time to report our findings and help our stakeholders use them. And we just really wanna make sure we address these questions directly. Now I'd like to shift our thinking uh, to evaluations specifically about ATE funded projects um, spe specifically. So the ATE program, uh, which Emma mentioned at the start of the webinar, this program funds many different kinds of projects with the common aim of improving the quality and quantity of technicians working in high tech fields. But would it be reasonable or fair to evaluate every ATE project against that ultimate long-term aim? I would say no. So the evaluation questions for any given ATE project really have to be tailored so they are aligned with its specific activities and goals. And I'm going to show you some uh, several examples uh, of evaluation questions from actual ATE proposals. So the, the documents that describe what a group wants to do, which includes the evaluation plan for the proposed work. Now I've modified the evaluation questions a little bit just to keep the projects um, anonymous, but just, just slightly. They're pretty authentic. So one evaluation uh, said it was going to investigate how industry field trips affected students' perceptions of high-tech jobs. Uh, similarly, another is going to investigate how inquiry-based labs influence students' career plans. Now, I want you to notice how these questions sort of telegraph an aspect of the project quality or effectiveness, as well as the kinds of data that might be collected to answer the question. So this question um, is about the extent to which professional development participants implement what they learn. So presumably, this, this is professional development for teachers. Um, so they want to know how the involved teachers take what they learn and put it in from the professional development and put it into practice in their classrooms. So that would be an important um, near-term or mid-term outcome for any kind of educator professional development inter intervention. So as for the data needed to answer this question, it would stand to reason that they would probably interview teachers or students or maybe observe classroom practices to assess the degree of implementation. So evaluation questions are signaling both what the evaluation will focus on and they're also often giving us hints about the type of data that would be collected. This question is asking uh, to what extent do did I already say that one? Sorry. To what extent do, I'm so sorry. To what extent do high school teachers increase their disciplinary knowledge and capacity to teach? It's another question. I'm trying to get it to where I have a poll activity here for you. Um, here we go. How well aligned with employers' needs are the courses developed by the project? So this is gonna be an activity for you now. We're going to go ahead and use the poll function. So right next to the chat uh, tab at the upper right of your screen, there's a, a tab that says polls, and you can click on that to get to the poll. So the question, how well aligned with employers' needs are the courses developed by the project? Um, what aspects, the poll question is, what aspects of project's quality does this evaluation question point to? Is it A, effectiveness in preparing workers for the job market? B, long-term sustainability of the project, C, student satisfaction with their educational experience, or D, responsiveness to industry need, uh, needs. So I'll give you a second to answer. Well, I can see most people are gravitating toward D. So, and after you answer, remember to go back to the chat so you don't miss anything there. Yep, it's responsiveness to industry needs. So that's the criteria um, 
that we're looking for in this project, right? So they, they're looking to see the extent to which employers' needs are being uh, reflected in these courses. So that's really the, the thing that's being signaled about what's important to this project. So likewise, so that's what we what's important, what the evaluation is going to focus on. So answer in the, if we can clear out the old poll, we have a new poll. Um, same question, uh, same evaluation question. So what kinds of data would be, would we need to answer this question? Would we uh, use A, graduation rates, B, interviews with employers compared with course objectives, C, historical trends in course enrollment, or D, surveys of students about their experience in the course? So we're, we're talking about in our questions, they help us, that identifies what we'll focus on, and they also give hints about the kinds of data that will be collected. So here we're, we're curious about what kind of data would be the best to answer this question. And I see most of you, 97% so far, not surprisingly gravitating toward B. Um, and that makes a ton of sense, right? The employer's perspective would be the essential data to have there to assess the relevance of the course content. Not that the other things might not, you know, might have relevance, but that would not be the core thing that we need. So in a nutshell, the function of evaluation questions is to point to what the evaluation will focus on, as well as the type of information that will be gathered. So next we're going to consider the form that evaluations should take. And I have some, um, I think, pretty straightforward tips when it comes to the wording of evaluation questions. So we've looked at some um, several examples from the ATE context, and it should be apparent by this point, you know, these evaluation questions can take many forms. Um, there's lots of ways to, to ask them. Um, but again, I have some, some basic rules of thumb that I think are helpful. So for example, I recommend that you avoid asking questions that can be answered with a number. And this may seem heretical to some of you. A lot of our, a lot of things we want to know can be answered with a number. But if you think about it, if the answer to your evaluation question is six or 152 or 3,000, you know, is that is that desirable or undesirable, good or bad? So those are really going to be data points. Um, whatever the, those numbers may represent uh, could be very important, but the numbers alone lack context. So we want to frame our questions in a way so it gives them, gives them some context. We also want to avoid yes, no questions. So these are essentially pass-fail questions, and really finding that dividing line between whether you can say something was effective or not, met its goals or not, works or not, for example, um, is that's, especially for complex projects, that's really not an easy thing to do and probably honestly not that useful for stakeholders. Instead, we want to allow for a continuum of answers. And this, um, your questions, you know, they can be easily fixed if you just start your questions with uh, phrases like, to what extent or to what degree uh, or even more broadly like what or how. So here's all those questions we reviewed and just notice that none of them are phrased as yes no questions or ask for a specific number. They're all open-ended and they allow for nuanced interpretations of data. So one caution here um, you do want to be prepared to answer questions uh, in the terms in which they're asked uh, to the extent possible. For example, if you ask a question about how well aligned something is, like uh, the example question of um, aligning uh, course content to employer needs, you want to make sure you're going to be able to answer about uh, the degree of alignment, such as the course content is somewhat or mostly aligned with employers' needs. So too often evaluation questions are posed, but no direct answer is given or not enough information is given so the stakeholders can form their own conclusion. So you want to think ahead about how you will answer the question. And this also requires thinking ahead uh, to the data analysis and interpretation phrases of your evaluation. For example, if you are asking a question about effectiveness, you think, want to think about the kinds of results you would need to see in order to claim something was, for example, very effective or extremely effective. So you want to make sure you've got a plan in place to collect and analyze and interpret data in ways that will really justify a conclusion 
related to the question. So as a case in point, thinking about professional development again, if you were only collecting data at the very end of a professional development experience for educators, um, you're really not going to get to data that you can use to make judgments about that professional development's effectiveness, because that's about implementing in the classroom. And if you're going to ask an extent question, you will want to talk to your stakeholders in advance about what results they would need to see in order to conclude that something was achieved to a great extent or a moderate extent and so forth. Now, if you ask an open-ended question about how something happened, you also want to make sure you're going to be able to collect sufficient data to describe the nature of the change, uh, its magnitude, how the change was brought about. Um, if you don't think you're going to be able to collect enough data to say, you know, answer a big question about like how or what, then you may want to narrow the scope of your question. And finally, you want to make sure your questions are answerable, right? It's very important. Uh, so think about the time available for data collection, uh, for analysis and interpretation, as well as what the project that you're evaluating can realistically achieve within the available time frame. So for the optimal form of evaluation questions, I'm encouraging you to phrase them in an open-ended way uh, that can be answered on, with data. Now, if you want to take a deeper dive into the form and function of evaluation question, I do invite you to invite uh, to download the evaluation questions checklist that was posted as a, as a handout. Uh, I co-authored this with my friend and colleague, Daniela Schroeder. Um, we're not going to get into the nitty gritty of, of these criteria. That's what the checklist is for, and you can consume that on your own. But it is a resource available to help you kind of check the quality of your questions as you're working on them. So with that, I would like to open things up for your questions and comments. So I'm going to turn things over to Emma. Thank you so much, Lori. So we had a couple questions come through during that first section. So the first section question is from Tom, and he asked, who generates the question? Evaluators, stakeholders, commissioner of the evaluation? Well, that's a great question, and we're going to, in the next section, we're going to talk about engaging stakeholders. So at minimum, you would want, uh, your, your, if you're the evaluator, you would want to engage at minimum the person or people who are going to be able to use the information uh, that you collect. That's really important. Now, it's, all, it's very uh, appropriate and a, a nice thing if you can cast a broad net to include a lot of different stakeholders. I mean, you want to be inclusive and all that. Um, but it's important not to include people just to make them feel included. If you're including uh, folks in generating evaluation questions, you want to make sure you can really use their input and so they can see their input reflected in those questions. So it's, um, you know, in a typical project, there's a primary client, so you would definitely want to include them in generating the questions because the evaluation is done uh, as a service to them. Now, in the NSF context, you most likely would not contact a program officer about a specific project and ask them what they want to know. Um, uh, but that may be different in different contexts, so it really depends. Um, but we are going to talk about involving stakeholders and, and considering stakeholder priorities um, in the next section. Um, so for our next question, it's kind of a, a trail of questions that came in. Um, and so I'm going to do my best. It is in the chat if you want to try to refer to it. Um, so let me just throw this one up here. Um, so this one kind of leads to a trail of questions. So questions which can be answered with a number can be useful if well-established standard thresholds is available for the relevant field application. Um, but then another question came in that kind of relates to that from Stephen that said, but ATE wants numbers, so degree certificate numbers of trained workers added to the workforce. Well, my client and I are more mm -hmm. concerned with evaluation questions like being taught. Mm -hmm. um, so I feel like, you know, it's not quite a question, but I feel like maybe you can address it having some of that context. Sure, sure. Um, um, Right, and so I definitely do not want to leave you with the impression that we're not interested <laughs> that we're not interested in numbers in evaluation. It's absolutely important. Some of the most important data is going to be in the form of numbers. It's just that if we if we start framing our questions about how many of this, how many of those, what percent, what average, what you're going to end up with, which is a long string of 
indicators and data points that you need for your evaluation. So my, my recommendation is to pull those together and kind of think about what it is you're really asking about. So if you want to know in the AT context, the number of certificates, um, you know, granted, uh, frame that in terms of, you know, are you meeting, um, are you meeting a, an industry need or uh, are you getting enough students through the program to justify its existence. It's hard for me to come up with the perfect question on the fly, but you'll, you definitely want to have those numbers. But um, I think what you, what I'm encouraging is to, to frame them in a way that uh, points to what is, is what you're looking for or valuable about the project, because those, the meaning of those numbers will, will shift drastically depending on the context, whether you're a very, you know, small college with a very new program versus a, a well-established um, program. So the numbers, the interpretation of the numbers will vary wildly depending on context. much, Lori. Um, so the next question came in from Morgan. Uh, to engage stakeholders, would you show them applicable data to generate questions? Is that not needed? Um, showing them applicable data. To, I'm not sure I entirely understand the question, but I'll, I'll answer it in this way. So I think when you're talking about, um, when you're sort of brainstorming questions, you might say, uh, you can kind of try on the answer for size. Well, let's say the answer is this um, and see if that seems like it's going to be useful information and actionable information. And that's so looking at data to think, you know, this is this is how this question, if we answer this question, this is the kind of data we might collect and these are the type of results we could possibly get. Does that feel important and relevant and useful information? So that's one way of bringing in data uh, at the at the early um, early end of, of developing evaluation questions. I do in encourage people, I think sometimes people when they think about evaluation questions is they worry too much about how they will measure it. Instead, I'd say focus on what questions that matter and what's important and then wrestle with the measurement later. All right, so our next question came in from Patricia. What strategy do you suggest in the case of creating questions for a community that the evaluator is not familiar with? to ensure cultural respect. Um, absolutely for, bring in uh, your, your, the, the stakeholders that are going to be affected, that are um, part of the community, that are part of the program. Uh, you definitely don't want to, if you're, if it's, definitely want to, don't want to go in if you're from outside that culture and that community um, and, and swoop in and, and tell them what they should care about. You want to listen very carefully, um, Best case scenario, you have members of the evaluation team or advisors who are representatives of that community, um, whether they've had, you know, direct lived experience in that or they can serve as sort of interpreters, but that's that's extremely, extremely important. Um, we're not really going to get into that into this webinar, but yeah, I don't want to, I don't want to leave you with the sense that evaluators can swoop in and, and direct all this I really need to bring in those uh, key stakeholders, representatives, communities, and really take time to listen and build trust and be responsive to what those communities care about. Here, Lori. So let me throw one, the next one up. Uh, so can you talk a little bit about articulating an evaluator's positionality and how that might influence or frame question creation, e.g. how an evaluator's values, background, privilege might be reflected in how the evaluation question is framed towards sure. gathering certain data. Thank you so much. Yeah, Mary. and I uh, think that relates to the break, prior question. More so, I mean, I could come into a situation and, and share what I think uh, would be important to ask and and where I'm coming from from that but uh, and that's important to, for people to know where you're coming from but I think more importantly is listening to what uh, the stakeholders involved um, where they're coming from and what they care about uh, maybe Lisa uh, Emma you or Anna could put in the chat the the Lisa's recent or Lisa our team members recent blog about positionality um, I'm not sure if she speaks to how that might affect evaluation questions um, but it might be a helpful resource. But I think with, with anything like where we come from, our, our values, our background, it's going to influence what we think matters. And it's really about having, you know, authentic conversations and 
people around the table to, to find to make sure the questions because you've only got limited resources right so making sure questions focus on what matters to people and what can be used because some things are you know in evaluation it, it's largely about gathering information and generating findings that can be put to use to to improve our work and to to be accountable and to to justify um, investment in our in our uh, efforts coming up so go ahead and keep putting those questions in uh, we would like to thank you all for those great questions. You may have additional questions that we didn't have time to answer during today's webinar. Hopefully that won't be the case, but we do encourage you to join Evaluate Slack community for a chance to ask questions, share experiences, and networks with other evaluation folks. So now I'm going to turn it over to Lori to start us in section two. All right. Thank you again for those great but not easy questions. <laughs> um, yeah, those are really good questions. Uh, let's see. So we reviewed the function and form of evaluation questions. And now we're going to talk about how to use multiple sources of information to develop your evaluation questions. And, and to do this, we're going to give it some context and we're going to work with a fictional project that I made up for this webinar. So Da Vinci Community College has NSF funding to develop a scientific illustration and animation associates of applied science degree program. It's an interdisciplinary uh, initiative between the fine arts and STEM faculties to develop an academic program that will prepare students to support engineering, technology, and scientific research and development firms with their visual communication needs. So I want you to note that I've kept this fictional project very simple so we don't get caught too caught up in the details and we can really focus on evaluation questions. Um, there's, there are four important sources. They are not by any means the only sources, but four important sources we're going to cover in this webinar um, of information to consider when developing evaluation questions. And these are the project goals, stakeholders, the sponsor's priorities, so in this case NSF, and the project's logic model. And we'll begin with goals because I think that really is usually the default or at least the starting point when folks start thinking about what a project's evaluation question should be. So here we go, project goals. So the project, the team for this project has identified four clear-cut goals, which are to design the AAS degree program in scientific illustration and animation, to develop and offer two new courses to support that program, introduction to scientific illustration and a capstone course, engage industry partners to provide ongoing input on the skills needed to meet their visual communication needs, and conduct outreach activities at the local high schools and the regional educational service agency. So many of you I'm sure are familiar with SMART goals. So SMART stands for, it's an acronym, stands for goals that are specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time bound. And you'll, I just want you to note these do fit that uh, profile for, for what it means to be a SMART goal. So first of all, why is determining the uh, why is it important to determine the extent to we, which a project meets its goals? Why do we care about this? Why do we do this? I'd like you to use your chat here to, to tell me what you think. This why do we why do people always want to measure the extent to which goals are met? Okay, Danny's mentioning return on investment. Accountability, Maureen says. It's going so far, I can't, I can't focus. Okay, keeps evaluation strategic, making recommendations for improvement. Carrie's saying justification. Lorraine suggests progress. We wanna know about progress. Greg, perfect answer. Well, they're all great, but to see if the project's doing what they said they will do. So underlying your comments and where I'm coming from, it's this idea of accountability. So project funders, collaborators, uh, institutional sponsors, they all want and need assurance that a project followed through on what it committed to do, right? So basically the federal government, in this case for the ATE program, the federal government gave you hundreds of thousands of dollars. So did you do what you said you were gonna do? And this is a completely reasonable expectation. Now, Michael Quinn Patton, an important and influential person in the evaluation field, who's written many books, um, has said that evaluation should include but not be limited 
to assessing whether stated goals were met. And here the others have pointed out that if we rely solely on goals to determine our evaluation question, we can run into some real problems. For example, if there are no clearly stated goals, or if goals are overly ambitious, um, you could waste a lot of resources trying to answer questions that just aren't answerable. And if the goals are focused um, mainly on a project's activities or implementation, then the evaluation isn't going to get to questions about outcomes, on impact, um, again, if we focus only on goals and they're not, goals don't mention outcomes. I should say, if they don't mention outcomes. So I want you to notice the goals of our Da Vinci project. So we're going to design the degree program, develop the courses, engage industry partners, and conduct outreach. These goals all focus on what the project will do. So whether or not these things happen is almost entirely almost entirely under the control of the project team. When we think about how to invest limited evaluation resources, we really want to make sure we're spending time and effort where evaluation expertise and resources are needed. And that's where we want to focus our evaluation questions. So basically, whether a project did these things can be demonstrated through basic annual reporting and project documentation. Um, NSF requires projects to submit annual reports uh, to them and it basically says, what did you do? So these straightforward um, things like, did you do these things? They don't really need to be part of a formal evaluation. You don't need someone from outside coming in and just giving you a, you know, checking a box to say you did it. However, the quality and impact of these activities should be established through evaluation. That does require more than just checking a box that was something that something was done or not. So with that in mind, thinking about this, this uh, conducting outreach goal they have, I'd like you to think about or use the poll um, to say which of these possible evaluation questions are address either the quality or impact of outreach events. So A, how many outreach events were held each semester? B, how effective were the outreach events in attracting new students to the SIA program? That's a scientific illustration. Or C, were the outreach events conducted as planned? I see you all gravitating towards B, which is great. That's right. So that's about effectiveness um, instead of the, the questions about outreach that could just be answered through basic project documentation. So you definitely have the hang of this. Um, Anna, I think we have two pulls up. Maybe we could clear that out. Or maybe I just see that. I don't know. Um, all right, so we picked B. So I, we have our first evaluation question, which is about the outreach activities. How effective were the outreach events in attracting new students to the SIA program? All right, I'm gonna go ahead and also suggest a question about the engaging industry activity. So notice that this question that I have here, how well aligned is the SIA curriculum to the needs of industry? That's about the degree of alignment instead of just whether industry was engaged. So we're able to ask a more evaluative question here and that's the whole point of evaluation, right? So now we have two evaluation questions based on these goals. So now let's turn uh, to our stakeholders as a source for determining evaluation questions. So given that all evaluators want their evaluations to be useful and used, right, um, so that really is, is means that stakeholders are going to probably be the single most important source of information when determining our evaluation questions. Um, again, evaluation is conducted in service to a project uh, and the project stakeholders. It's not this end in itself that evaluators come in and, and pursue questions that, that are in, of interest to them. So the people involved in and affected by a project should be a primary source for determining evaluation questions. So what do they wanna know? What do they care about? Uh, what's, what's meaningful to them? What are their values? We need to ask them. But it's unlikely, honestly, to, to be that productive if you just ask stakeholders, what are your burning evaluation questions? Instead, we wanna come at it a little bit sideways. We wanna ask, um, what do you hope to learn from the evaluation? What kinds of information do you need to inform your decisions uh, about your work? 
How will you use the information you obtain from this evaluation? And are the aspects of the project you're more or less certain about? Let's focus on areas where folks are less certain. And the conversations that flow from these questions will illuminate what the stakeholders value, what their information needs are, and importantly, where evaluation resources should be invested. So for our project at Da Vinci Community College, uh, let's say one of our stakeholders is a dean, and they say, um, well, we've never done a truly interdisciplinary program like this. I really want to know um, what the lessons learned are that we can apply to the development of other new interdisciplinary initiatives. And tracking lessons learned is a common thing that evaluators do, um, and it, especially as you're working to identify a project's strengths and weaknesses. So we can easily translate the dean's input into an evaluation question that asks, what are the lessons learned in developing this program that could be applied to other disciplinary initiatives? So not, not a lot of creativity needed to translate that uh, question into an evaluation question, or that it, information needed into an evaluation question. So here we have another possible evaluation question. So an evolved faculty member adds, well, I'd like to know if the program equitably serves students of all different genders, races, and ethnicities. So no doubt this is a really important question and something that NSF cares deeply about as well. So we could translate this into an evaluation question that asks, to what extent are program opportunities and benefits equitably distributed? Now, another stakeholder in the room, uh, a subject matter expert, chimes in and says, I'm so excited about this project. I think we should really aim high. I want to know if this is the best degree program of its kind at the two-year college level. Well, this comment should send up some red flags if you're wearing your evaluator cap. We, we would want to ask some follow-up questions like, well, okay, what does best mean to you? How would we operationalize that? What data would we need to answer this question? Uh, will the answer inform any future actions? If you can massage this, this information uh, request into a reasonable evaluation question, then I'd say go for it. So, but for our purposes, we're going to set this one aside because it feels like it's unlikely to be directly answerable, and it's unclear if that information is really needed for any practical purpose. So we're actually going to take a, a little break here before we move on to our other sources of information for evaluation. Oops, there's our two questions that we generated from stakeholders that we'll add to the mix. And I believe now we have a question break. So after the break, we're going to talk about um, sponsor priorities and logic models as a source of evaluation questions. So Emma, do we... I'm sure we have some questions. Absolutely. So we've got one here from Michael. And they asked, when deciding the form of an evaluation, how much does an agency funding and resources come into play? How do you balance the goal of the evaluation with the methods of it? So resources are always an important consideration, right? So it's always a balancing act. Balancing act. What do uh, stakeholders want to know? What does the funder uh, require the evaluation to do? What are the resources available? Including not just money, but time, honestly. Um, time uh, in terms of what the project can bring about in terms of the available time frame, and time needed to collect data and, and analyze and report and all that. So it's really a balancing act. So Emma, I'm afraid I'm straying for it. Can, like, what's the crux of the question again? Sorry. You should be able to see it up in the corner there. Oh. Right? Yep. So just when deciding the form of an evaluation, how much does the agency's funding and resources come into play? Yeah, well, it's huge, right? Because you can't you can't come up with uh, lofty evaluation questions that are simply unanswerable based on the resources. Um, so it's very context dependent. I don't have, like, there's no magic answer to that, but it, I mean, you always are constrained by resources. So being realistic about that is important. I would, I would encourage folks to not be so worried about that when you're kind of brainstorming evaluation questions. Um, but then as you're narrowing in, then think about, okay, could we really answer this with available resources? Right, so Tom asked, how does one ensure ethical questions? That's a really good question. In fact, the handout that we have, the evaluation questions checklist, that is due for um, an update, and that is my uh, that is my number one priority is to get the the ethical dimension in there, because if you can't 
ask a, if you can't answer a question as using ethical methodologies and reporting, then it shouldn't be asked. Um, I also think we have to be very careful about making sure our questions don't reproduce or perpetuate uh, inequities um, and, and, and further uh, excluding people. And I, the one example I think of uh, is in, that this um, wording around like achievement gap in education. And uh, this was something that I had, I recently worked on a book and it went through a diversity, equity and inclusion review, which was hugely eye-opening for me. And it's like, if we were asked questions about like, did we narrow the achievement gap between certain groups of people? That is a implicit um, sort of, uh, affirmation that, that the problem is differences in achievement instead of differences in opportunity. So I do think it's very important to attend to uh, think about how the question will be answered. Can it be answered ethically in terms of people's privacy and things like that, but also the way we ask them. Is, are we being um, fair, equitable? Are we avoiding sort of re reproducing inequities or um, biases and things like that? So I haven't solved that <laughs> issue yet about how to make sure our questions, evaluation questions are ethical, but it is something I, I'm hoping to tackle with my co-author on that checklist. Thanks for that question. Um, I'm going to go ahead and move us forward to your next section. We do have one more question break coming up, so I want to make sure we get through that content. Um, so I'll go ahead and hand it back over to you, Lori. Okay, thank you. So um, the project sponsor or funder is a special type of stakeholder. So in this case, we're going to be talking about the National Science Foundation particularly. So in the AT context, NSF is a major stakeholder, but they're not a person, right, with individual concerns. And, and uh, so as the sponsor of an ATE project, we're going to think about their organizational priorities rather than uh, the specific um, concerns and information needs of, of particular individuals. And so uh, where do we learn about NSF's priorities for the evaluation of ATE projects? Uh, we got to look at the ATE program solicitation. And other funders will have uh, other similar documents that might be called a request for a proposal or a notice of funding opportunity or a funding opportunity announcements, these go under different names, but they're going to often include uh, information about what the sponsor wants to see from evaluation. And you definitely want to review these documents for information about what the sponsor wants. So first off, the ATE program solicitation states that the evaluation should address both project implementation and outcomes. But what does this really mean? Um, so on the implementation or process side, uh, there's several things we could look into, the content, the products, the reach or satisfaction. I have some additional notes on each of these. If anyone would like me to dive a little bit deeper in any of these, I don't think I've got like enough time to talk about each one specifically, but I'm gonna look at the chat. Anything you wanna know more about there? Well, I can come back to this. So let me know if you want to dive deeper into any of these. But these are the kinds of things we might look at if we're uh, focusing evaluation on a uh, process, the project's implementation. And for outcomes, we would be looking, these are, out outcomes are always changes, right? And they, but they might be within individuals or organizations or communities or systems or workforce. And again, uh, I can dive deeper into any of these, maybe at the question breaks, like, well, what do you mean by systems? How would we evaluate changes at systems? Um, I can speak to that. I do want to uh, speak to this, because this is so important, equity, diversity, inclusion. Um, this is cross-cutting both process and outcomes. Um, so how opportunities and benefits um, are, distributed uh, are associated with the project, how opportunities and benefits and other things that the project uh, offers are distributed across different kinds of people. This is really important. ATE projects have ethical obligations to serve diverse audiences, to create welcoming environments for all, to advance equity, and these are all really important um, considerations in both process and outcome evaluations. Um, NSF has a whole uh, 
whole area of interest called broadening participation, which is about getting uh, people from all walks of life, all different genders, races, ethnicities, and so forth um, into STEM. So that's basically when NSF says they want process uh, evaluation and outcome evaluation. It's not that you have to look at every one of these things, but this just gives you sort of a menu of things you could, might possibly consider. So going back, thinking about that program solicitation, it does offer a few clues about what NSF wants to see in evaluation of specific types of projects. So the project we're working on here is uh, called a program development and improvement project. And for this type, NSF wants to see data on outcomes related to student completion and job placement. So pretty clear specifications about what they want to see. So with regard to student completion, I'm going to suggest that we ask something like how successful is the SIA program in graduating students? Um, so I didn't ask how many students did it graduate because we would need some, but we'd want to have a conversation with stakeholders about what success is. And by that we could look at other uh, programs in our in our college, what, what it looks like for new programs versus established programs and things like that. So we would have some reference point for saying what success is. Now with regard for job to job placements, I'm going to suggest that we ask to what extent are program graduates successful in obtaining jobs that utilize the knowledge and skills they required they acquired through the program. Now here that's a very <laughs> wordy question. My original one was did graduates get jobs, right? But it's not so much did they get jobs. What's important is they are they getting jobs um, using the credentials that they got, because this AT is about meeting industry needs. We'd want to know that they're getting, not just getting jobs, but getting jobs in, in relevant areas. So these are the two questions that I would suggest based on NSF's desire to see uh, findings on completion and job placement. So we're going to go ahead and move on to the logic model as a source. So goals and stakeholders and sponsor priorities are all really important sources of information. Um, but my favorite source is a logic model because it really should already reflect project goals and stakeholder interests and sponsor priorities to some extent. And it's just so, it's such a useful tool for so many reasons. So this project logic model has four main uh, headings here, as you'll see. And if our resources allow for the evaluation, our aim is really to have questions that cover the entire logic of the evaluation of the project. So I've gone ahead and plugged in the activities here in the first column. And this was easy because it's the project's main activities were spelled out in their goals, if you recall. Those were really activity focused goals. So I just plugged those in. And we talked about how the first two activities don't really need evaluation questions because they're going to be addressed through basic uh, annual reporting. And we actually already came up with questions based on uh, the two activity focus goals about alignment of the curriculum and effectiveness of outreach. So we have our activities covered through either evaluation or basic project reported. So I'm going to go ahead and shade them out so we don't get distracted by them. And I want to go ahead uh, and look at the long term outcomes. So this project is really about getting students into jobs where they can use their skills as well as closing the, the gap between uh, the visual communication skills that workers have currently and what employers really need. Now we actually already have a question about the graduates getting jobs that we derived from the ATE program solicitation just now. So I just plug that in here. And I'm going to go ahead and gray that out now. Um, this other long-term outcome about closing the skills gap, I'm just going to venture that's probably not answerable in the project's three-year time frame. So we're not going to go ahead and try to answer that in this evaluation, but maybe in a follow-up study. But I do think it's important to keep um, that in the logic model uh, because it is what the project is about. But that brings us to the middle of our logic model where we connect activities to outcomes. And we actually already have a question that relates to the second midterm outcome about graduation rates. We're asking how successful the SIA program is graduate in graduating students. So that's covered. Which leaves us to, with two outcomes in the middle of our logic model that we do not have evaluation questions for. So let's look at that um, short term outcome in the second column. What would be a good evaluation question to ask here? I'm going to let you vote on this. So here's the 
little uh, box that remains. So students who take the new SAA 1000 course continue in the program. Uh, which evaluation question best addresses this short-term outcome? So would it be A, to what extent the new course serves as a gateway into the SAA program? B, how do students perform in the new course compared with other intro courses? Or C, what is the completion rate for the new course? Again, most of you are gravitating toward A, and that really is the critical linkage between the project activity of creating the new course and getting students into and graduated from the degree program. And that's the importance of looking at uh, not just activities or long-term goals, but seeing if we've got a pathway to get to our outcomes. You can imagine this, the faculty could create an amazing course um, that uh, students take, but then they don't end up going further on in the program. So that would that would be a problem. And you'd want to know that early on, right? So we're going to go ahead and put that question right here. So we have that short-term outcome covered, and we're going to go on to the midterm one. Single element left without a question. So in the interest of time, I'm just going to show you the question that I came up with, which is uh, to what extent do students, here you go, to what extent do students in the SA program gain the skills needed by scientific research and development firms? So we do have that question from earlier about the alignment of the curriculum with employer needs, but that's really not the same as to whether students actually develop those skills. So this would be a pretty important question about this midterm outcome, I think. So now we have a total of eight goals. I mean, sorry, questions. Um, the first two came from goals, um, which are focused on the project activities. The two uh, we added from going through the logic model, and these are about the short and midterm outcomes that didn't come up from any of our other sources that we consulted. And two questions relate to the mid and long-term outcomes um, based on what NSF wants to know from the evaluation. And then finally, the question provided by stakeholders are really cross-cutting um, and are very specific to their information needs. But these two questions, uh, you know, these really wouldn't take a lot of extra resources because they're things that, we, that kind of emerge as the evaluation unfolds. So I want to leave plenty of time for all your questions, so I will wrap it up. And in a nutshell, again, uh, for a complete set of meaningful evaluation questions, we want to consult multiple information sources. Um, and we always want to look beyond goals because that can be fairly limiting if we don't look beyond goals. So Emma, um, I'm, I think we probably have a lot of questions. I'm hoping it's fun to answer questions. So I'm going to th turn things back to you for our final question break. Glory. So in just a moment, we will enter into our final question break. But first, I want to acknowledge that writing evaluation questions can be a lot easier when you have someone to bounce ideas off of. Evaluate coaches are available for just that. So if you're associated with an AT project or planning to submit an AT proposal, take advantage of this free opportunity to talk with one of our three wonderful coaches. For more information on connecting with Lola, Amy, or Keith, you can see our web, website, evaluate.org slash coaching. So now we will go ahead and get to those questions you guys have submitted. Thank you so much for everyone who's put in questions. Um, so we have some from the first and second that have fallen over. So this one says, do you have any recommendation for cases where evaluation questions imposed by clients mismatch with the actual purpose of the evaluation? Mm or what the client is actually trying to understand? Mm -hmm. That's a great question, and I don't have examples of that, so I'd invite our other participants to share examples. I'm sure that's happened. Absolutely, and it can be something we can work on and evaluate to kind of help collect that and connect with you on this side for that. All right, so this next question came in from Sunday. They said, how long will a project stay before checking the influence of bene on beneficiaries? Can you say that again? I'm trying to find it, but it would be faster if you just read it to me, Emma. Yeah, it, I, it, the wording's a little different. Um, so how long will a project stay before checking the influence on beneficiaries? Mm. 
Um, yeah, and I saw some comments from Stephen about the long, you know, the, are we being realistic about what can be achieved in these short-term projects um, and what the evaluation could measure? Uh, when do we start looking for impacts on folks? And I think that's really the value of doing things incrementally. So uh, in, in terms of how long it takes to uh, get a, a degree program up and running uh, and measured, and ATE honestly does lots of other things other than degree programs um, and, a and so in some cases a lot of legwork has been done and so the the program can really can really launch and go um, but it's entirely possible you know there might be delays and there might be a lot not a lot of students um, graduating in that time frame and I think in those cases you want to make sure you're gathering data about some leading indicators so let's say you have some students entering the program um, and you're, they're not going to get graduated in by the time you got to submit your, your final reports. Um, you can then, you know, get some proxies, basically. So ask them, uh, do you intend to stay in this program? What other thing, what other programs are you considering? How likely are you to, to take the next, you know, sequence of courses required? So you have to get some, be creative and get some proxies. But I think a lot of ATE projects um, will continue, often get no cost extension. So that's something to think about. Like, you don't want to throw any, you know, throw any questions away because oftentimes projects ends up at least a year longer than what they were slated for. And lots of times AT projects and others um, will continue uh, with additional grants. Uh, evaluate is in what, Emma, it's our fourth, uh, our fourth, our fourth. So uh, impacts that we couldn't have dreamed of assessing in our first, you know, four years, we're now, we, we're, we're build, building on our evaluation and we can and address those. So thinking about it in terms like an ongoing endeavor and also endeavors that, you know, institutions, if there's resources and will available, might want to continue evaluation uh, be even beyond the funding period. When stakeholders suggest evaluation questions that sound more like survey items, how do you redirect them? Yeah, yeah. That's such a common thing in terms of even when, like I said, when you talk about evaluation questions, people think it's their survey questions, their survey questions. Um, uh, and sometimes it might be a one to one match. Rare, most often, I think uh, it, our evaluation questions are bigger than a single single survey question. Um, in terms of redirecting them, I'd look at a set of evaluation questions about your endeavor. Um, often a question we get is how many questions you should have. And I think, you know, there's no right or wrong answer there, but I think if you have so many questions, you can't remember all of them, you probably have too many. If you've got, you know, 15 to 20 evaluation questions, that's that's probably too many. So if, if that could be something that if, if for redirection, we're like, okay, well, we've got, you know, 25 questions now, let's consolidate. What are the larger concepts or criteria or uh, areas of impact that we wanna know about? And let's plug in those more specific items under those as, as indicators, or we might even have um, evaluation sub questions, which is fine as well. Models. So is a logic model part of the evaluation or part of a project development implementation? Yeah, that's an age old question too, right? Like logic model isn't inherently evaluative. They're just so helpful for evaluation. So what often happens, I think, is if a project doesn't have a logic model, many evaluators will want to help them develop one because it's such a useful tool. Um, but it really is part of project planning and development. Um, so, but sometimes the the folks on the project staff don't haven't had experience and don't have the skill in developing it, so they need the help of and guidance of an evaluator. But technically, it's really project planning side, but it, practically, it's often the evaluator uh, assisting with that and then using it as a as a tool to to frame the evaluation. Well, thank you everyone for your great questions. Um, we are about to launch, Anna just launched the pre, uh, post webinar survey. Um, we really encourage you to fill this out. The survey helps inform evaluate on how to continually improve our webinar series. Um, and there were a handful of questions we didn't get to. And of course you may have additional questions um, now that we've joined us for this webinar. So if we didn't get your question answered, we encourage you to attend our web chat next week Tuesday. Um, our web chats are small group discussions around various topics. 
And next week we will be focusing on the webinar topic and really chatting with Lori to try to find some additional answers to these questions you have. So if you've not already done so, please jump on our website and register for that free event next Tuesday. Um, and that actually brings us to the close of today's webinar. So Lori and I and everyone from the Evaluate team really thank you for joining us today and the great interactivity we were able to have with you. As always, if you have additional questions, please feel free to contact us through our website. Um, and with that, happy Wednesday, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us.